So welcome to the Global Roads Industrial Community Meeting. So before the presentation, I'd like to share some logistic issues. So everybody in this meeting is muted. Only the presenter will be able to talk. So every presenter, please mute yourself when I'm, you're not talking. Uh, we will have 10 minutes for each speaker and five minutes for Q&A. Uh, this event will be recorded and uh, will be posted afterward. So I'd like to thank you to every developers and the contributors to this uh, community. And thank you to the Ross Industrial Consortium for your continued support. And thank you to Southwest Research Institute. They put a lot of time and effort to make this event online. And thank you all for your uh, joining. So here is the agenda. So before the presentation, we have two announcements from uh, Sean and Paul. The first one is about the month developer meeting reboot event. The second one is the training and the annual meeting events uh, presented by Paul. And then I will present uh, a little bit introduction about RADO and the several roles related projects here at the Re Robotic Research Center at the Nanyang Technology University in Singapore. So following that is uh, Suraj from TUM Create. He will present uh, uh, robotics at the TUM Create Singapore, the insight into role-based projects. Uh, the third presenter, Georgia uh, from FZI Germany, he will present the REAP project MDE for ROS, generic IO for Fanuc robots. And the, the last presenter is Sir Luis from OSRF. He will give us an introduction about the Gazebo UX test driver. And finally, Paul will give us a closing remarks. So before uh, I present, I will hand over to Sean to give us this announcement. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, uh, everyone, for uh, for being here. And um, yeah, um, so I just wanted to inform everybody. Uh, over the past year, we've been holding uh, developers meetings. Um, so it's different than these community meetings, or at least was meant to be different. Uh, in that, uh, the goal was to kind of coordinate activities, development activities, technical activities. Uh, among all the Ross Industrial developers. Um, so um, clearly a, a smaller group of people than typically attend these community meetings, which is why we put them together. Um, over the past few months, we've had a, a few scheduled conflicts, so we've missed some meetings. Uh, I didn't want people to think that the meetings have gone away. Um, so we're kind of calling this a reboot of the meetings. Um, our next developer meeting will be held on February 14th. Uh, it's typically the second Tuesday of the month. Um, and uh, we're going to refocus the meetings again on organizing the raw side developers. Um, and the reason for the announcement here is just to let people know we want people to participate. Uh, it is invite only uh, to the meeting, but you know anybody can request an invite. And we're really looking for people with um, interest in making significant contributions to Ross Industrial. Um, and uh, people should come to the meeting ready to take ownership of, of tasks and, and assignments and, and commit to delivery dates so that we can um, you know, push development forward with Ross Industrial. And so if you're interested in participating or you have some feedback for me on the um, developers meetings to date, I'm very interested to hear either. Um, there's my email. You can certainly reach out to me, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about the developers meeting. That's it. Thanks. Good. We hand over to Paul. Hey everyone, this is uh, Paul Vaz. Um, got a quick announcement about our upcoming Ross Industrial Training class. It is occurring about a month from now, February 13th through 15th. It'll be here at Southwest Research in San Antonio, Texas. It is three days of curriculum. 
Uh, we do start off the first day with ROS basics. Second day is a combination of motion planning with Move It and perception in PCL. Uh, the third day we do lab exercises with some real hardware that we have here at Southwest, uh, generally some collaborative robots, and uh, maybe in juxtaposition to the, the industrial robot you see in the picture. You will need to bring a laptop with you and we'll provide a virtual machine for you to download so that you have kind of the, the right configuration for the class. We do expect people to have familiarity with command line interface of Linux and then also a background using C++. Uh, for more information, please check out the training link there. Um, one other pitch before we move beyond this slide is that uh, we have our upcoming Ross Industrial Consortium Americas meeting uh, the first week of April. It'll be following the Automate trade show. So the Friday after Automate, there'll be more information coming out about that, so stay tuned. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, Paul. So uh, this is my presentation. My name is Chung Hui. I'm from Robotic Research Center in the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. So what I'm going to present today is an introduction to RADO. RADO means the Robot Application Development and Operation Environment. And we'll talk a little bit about several roles related to projects here undergoing in Robotic Research Center in NTU. So before talking about RADO, I'd like to share your uh, information about the uh, ASTAR Industrial Robot project here in Singapore. This is actually the three years uh, industrial robot research project. It is a very big project. Uh, it is kind of a national effort project, including three universities and uh, two research local in research institutes here in Singapore. So it includes eight work packages. The first one is the interface. The second one is perception. The third one is planning and manipulation. WP4 is about control. WP5 is adaption. Uh, W6 and W7 are uh, two demonstration. One is for welding and another one is for polishing and finishing. Uh, I'm a, actually a research fellow in WP8 uh, in the RADO. So RADO is a core component to integrate the research result of other packages in a common platform. So why we want to develop a radio? Uh, everybody knows that it's well known that the current industry robots mainly work in automobile industry. They are very hard to program. You need experts to program an industry robot, and it is very hard to operate. And it is shows some kind of advanced capability. So in the ASTAR industry robot, uh, a project, we want to develop uh, some advanced capabilities for the future industrial robots. For example, the interface for human ro robot interaction, uh, 3D sensing and perception, and advanced uh, manipulation and uh, adaptive gripping, grasping, and even compliant motion control. Uh, so RADO is a kind of uh, platform developed there based on ROS and the ROS industry. It is an incorporation of high-level robotic software, which has been developed in the other work packages in the ASTAR industrial robot projects for different robotic applications. So RADO is built up on ROS and the ROS industry. We use a lot of different uh, packages from ROS and the ROS industry. So the segmentation of this radio architecture actually divides to three different uh, users. The first one is mainly for the developer. Uh, uh, we have our full-time research to develop the various work packages and then put it together. And then we have programmers whose role is to link different work packages and the generate necessary tasks for the operate. And finally, is the operator who operates the, ro the robot is the end user. The way we use this result, I interact with the tasks. 
So Rado plays a role that is seamlessly integration between different uh, working packages. So we have developed a visual programming tool to automatically generate ROS launch files. Then you, you don't need to bother in open a text editor to write all these uh, launch file and uh, parameters arguments. We have a tool to automatically generate the launch file. And then we have a uh, uh, visual and uh, different plugins which can be launched in RVZ environment for different uh, applications. And we have the same package release and distribution mechanisms for the packages developed in Rado. So all these packages are built on top of ROS. So you don't need special uh, configuration requirement for your laptop. So this figure shows a general look of what I have mentioned of these three roles. So in general, we are different work packages. We are develop the packages which could be launched as a plugin in our ways. We also have different function tools. For example, what I have mentioned about the visual programming tool or natural language interface tool or calibration tool or 3D sensing tool. So we have a, a user interface. So this is the, the user interface uh, is the GUI. Uh, it's mainly for set up new robotic applications, do some parameter starting. Uh, you can access tools and different plugins. For example, on, on the right side, on the top is a common interface. This is common interface for different robot applications. You can directly control each joint or get a feedback from the joint values. The second layer is several tools for different uh, common applications. For example, the visual programming tool or URDF editor. Uh, the third layer here is the plugins. For example, we have the natural language plugins, 3D sensing plugins. So when you click this, we will pop up uh, uh, interface and connect to the work packages that other research has developed. On the left side is the 3D, uh, uh, we use the uh, RVs, lab RVs to show the URDF model of the robot. So in the below of this dialogue, we have four steps that you can select different robot you want to use. For example, you want to use the UR5, UR10, ABB robot. You can choose different end factor, work cell or work piece, and you can configure it to the location you want to do it. And all this through a URDF editor we have developed in Rado. So here shows you uh, two pictures of the visual programming tool. Uh, this tool is used very useful to create and maintaining a launch files. It's like a lab view in, in ROS. So you can create the new nodes. Uh, set up the arguments, uh, all these values. And it's very convenient and easy to select a drug and connect different nodes, passing the topical messages and set up the environment values. Uh, with one click, you can create a very complex launch file. We also have a simulator embedded. This helps the robot operate to easily view and verify the task. And we have two parts. The first simulator you can simulate in RVs, another one you can uh, verify in Gazebo. So we also supporting uh, multiple URDF files and trajectory files for the robot operators. So here it shows that we have a plugin uh, which embedded in the Gazebo. So these plugins, you can import the, the task you have built and then it can output if this trajectory is valid or not valid. So it can and do some validation for your simulation. And the figure below shows we did a, a, a simulator for the automated robot taping task, as you show. And we also have uh, intermediate language uh, embedded in Rado in order to have the same task can be applied into different robots. So you can have the same 
programming in your radar environment, but uh, this program can be executed on different robots. For example, uh, on an ABB or KUKA or on universal robot. So we have several applications for the radar. Uh, the first one is uh, automated robot items picking system. And we are, as a team, I am, we are the finalist of the first Amazon picking challenging uh, in Seattle. And uh, the software packages is uh, uh, open sourced. You can follow in the below link to get the source code. And this is the integration of the research works in WP2, 3, uh, 5, and 8 in the ASTAR Industrial Robots program. So this system is get the... Uh, now, this is a general view of the, the whole packing, uh, picking system. So we recently, we just get an uh, improved version uh, on the right side. This is second version. We are collaborating with two local e-commerce company. Uh, we have made a mobile base, uh, improved the robot gripper and the uh, vision system. So you can follow in this link to play the video to see the, the robot picking picker it works. So the second demo we have is uh, uh, automated robot tapping system, which is for the aerospace uh, applications in order to automate the tape the area that uh, uh, company used in the aerospace uh, repairing uh, applications. So the robot actually using a 3D sensor to capture the object you want to tape. And we have an uh, algorithm to automatically generate the track, uh, the taping trajectory for the uh, robot. And uh, we also build this uh, simulator. You can uh, validate your motion uh, trajectory for the robot uh, and see the result. Uh, probably I don't have time to play the video. Uh, you can click the link as you want to see it. Uh, another demo we did based on Radar is a dual arm small part sorting. We are using a, a dual arm industry robot from next stage from Kavada industry. And we did some uh, small parts sorting and the dual arm manipulation. Uh, and this is a combination of uh, object recognition, post registration, and a dual arm manipulation. Uh, all these packages are available in Radar uh, as a uh, uh, packages and the plugins. So it's very easy to configure it. And this project is built by two final year students. Okay, other roles related projects here in Robotic Research Center. Uh, uh, the first one is QuickBot. This is uh, a mobile robot to do indoor construction quality inspection. It's already on, on the news, so you can Google it. And it's, and uh, know more about it. And this Erdiga for a robot of a Dahar is a telepresent robot. So we also use ROS uh, to build the software behind of it. Uh, the Picto robot on the right side is the, probably the biggest robot in the world. So it's three meters tall. It's used for high ceiling painting. So you can also Google and uh, know more about it. We also have uh, put it rob industry robot for 3D concrete printing and uh, e-commerce uh, picking and uh, be manual patient for, for example, to assembling a IKEA chair. So for more information, you can visit the website of Robotic Research Center. Uh, and in conclusion, is the radio will be released in the next two months. So because the ASTAR robot is coming to end now, uh, the radio has been developed in several successful demonstrations. So we have included uh, different packages from Ross Industrial, for example, the movie and the filming, uh, and this card for the motion planning. And we also have the industrial calibration tools embedded. So we are continuous integration with other work packages and to increase the uh, radar capability and the usability. So in conclusion, the ROS industry and the ROS is widely used in different robotic projects here in NTU and in the research institutes here in Singapore. And that's all. Thank you. More information, you can contact with me.
So welcome just... to Georgia. Okay, so no question round, right? Yeah, question time. Okay. Yeah. Great. We have three minutes for questions. Don't see any. Should I start? Yeah, you can start it. No question. Yeah. Okay. So, um, hello, everyone. My name is. Oh, there is a, a question. Sorry. So, I'll give you a question time. Okay. Any of your robotics demos use ROS industrial factors? Sure. Uh, we use the calibration tool and the uh, discard for a motion trajectory generation. So, uh, Isaac, you are very known our uh, next stage robot. I have already discussed with you, with you. And then that source code will be also uh, public next week, probably. Uh, NTU will attend APC this year. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we have attended the first uh, Amazon Picking Challenging, and now we are collaborating with local companies to uh, build the real one. Hope it works in the uh, real warehouse. Uh, Radar will be released. Uh, we will put upload our source code on GitHub. So uh, we'll send the announcement when this project is ended. Okay, George, I think you can start it. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, hello everyone. My name is uh, Georg Hetner. I'm from um, the FZI in Karlsruhe in Germany. Uh, I posted the video I'm going to show beforehand in the chat so you can open it there. So, quickly, where I'm coming from, the FZI is a nonprofit research organization with about 150 scientific employees. And uh, we are something like an innovation hub for the Southwest southwest part of Germany and we focus mainly on technology transfer especially into small and medium-sized enterprises um, so I'm particular coming from the living lab service robotics where we do basically anything robotics um, but uh, we have much to do with field and service robotics so for example you can see down in the slides our six-legged walking robot or so space robots that can assemble themselves or some AGVs um, but also so industrial applications, like I will talk about now, um, or of course, client-specific robotic solutions. Um, for example, in the pictures down there, you can see uh, a large robot used for decontamination. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, our project, so what we do at the FZI, um, with the example of the RIA project. So uh, next up is the video, so I encourage you to start it on your own, and I will do it here. So I'll click on start now and talk just over it. I hope you see it the same as we did. So this video gives you um, a quick introduction into what the reapp vision actually is. So uh, and this is an automotive use case done with uh, together with BMW. BMW. And uh, you see here that we have constructed an application um, into a solution, we call it, out of three different apps. And these apps are now um, transformed or, or transferred into an integration platform that is running ROS and doing the magic in the background. Um, of course, we have some kind of safety, but that is done with traditional safety, although we read out uh, all the data in ROS, of course. Um, now onto the real application scenarios. So um, 
we want to um, fix uh, insulation mat to door. So we have three steps. The first step is to identify which door we're dealing with, which is done with an RFID reader. The second one is to localize the door, in this case with a, a 3D vision camera from Fanuc. And the third part is doing the actual work where we press uh, with the Fanuc robot against the insulation mat to fix it uh, to the door. And um, the clue of Reapp now is that we want to easily change this application. So, for example, we don't have this fancy vision camera, and we want uh, our visionists to have it as simple as this. To pick out this one app, which is doing the localization, and replace it with another, in this case, with a light bridge. And then again, we can deploy the solution. All of the parts which are um, the same as before will stay the same, and uh, only the part that we actually wanted to replace, in this case, the door localization, will be handled differently. Um, and the interesting part is, although we are doing something completely different, the semantic meaning is actually the same. So in both cases, we are doing a door localization, no matter if we do it with a laser scanner or with a um, light barrier. Okay, I'm seeing that the uh, video playing in the screencast is going a little bit slower. So uh, yeah, Reap achieves this with semantics in the background and adding uh, model-driven engineering to the ROS part. So uh, I just wanted to focus quickly on the tools that we developed. So in Reap, uh, we've created the Reap Engineering Workbench, which is an Eclipse application consisting mainly of um, the component modeling tool, which allows you to use model-driven engineering tools. So basically, you describe what an app does. And this is, of course, extra effort to the usual ROS generation, um, but it gets better in the next step when you use the component code generation tool, which can then generate a complete ROS package out of the description that you've just given. So for example, you define the topics and all of the code stops for subscription or publication of these topics will be automatically generated. And um, of course, you have to still fill in the actual algorithm. And the third part is then the skill or solution modeling tool in which you can use these packages. And you see on the right, there are these little blue and red um, boxes. So each of those is an app and you can combine them together to generate a bigger app in our nomenclature. So um, what we actually do is creating a launch file in the background. And all of this is then executed on the integration platform. Uh, why should you care about this? In general, I think model-driven engineering is a good tool, especially to help beginners or people not an expert in a field um, to come to grips with this uh, quite complex area of robotics. Uh, it can also enhance the reusability of packages, which you wrote with quite some dedication. Um, and we tried it out in workshops with different people, especially with uh, system integrators and end users, which are not that familiar with coding. Uh, they kind of liked the idea. And of course, it's not yet a finished product, um, but it's already quite stable version that you can use. And you can check it out at the project page at Reap Project. Uh, and we're also planning a full open source release in 2017 once we cleaned up some of the la, more ugly parts. So um, the second part I wanted to talk about is uh, actually one of the pilot demonstrators, uh, which you also seen in the in the video before. So we used a Fanoc M710 uh, for the insulation mat pressing, and we had to um, do control and sensing of various binary signals. So for example, extend the cylinder, retract the cylinder, uh, read out end switches and all of that. And we didn't want to use um, field bus interfaces because there were a couple of reasons uh, speaking against that, mainly availability. So we asked around and then uh, were led to uh, Sean, who told us, well, there is a nice rap from Mr. Van der Horn, who, uh, uh, which I read, and I found it quite nice, and we decided to implement it. So this uh, rap was written by him, and we just uh, did some implementation on that. Um, so... What it does is basically copying the behavior of the um, industrial robot client. So you have a robot-specific um, site that which runs on the robot controller, in this case, a Carol program for the Fanuc. You have um, an industrial I.O. client, which is based on the industrial robot client, just you would, like you would have for uh, streaming motion commands. And you have the simple messages as communication format between them. And if we look at the architecture the picture of Ross Industrial, I hope this is still um, 
the latest one, then uh, you can see that we basically enhanced um, this ROS interface layer um, with a new interface in a similar way to the driver interface. Um, so the rep defines several profiles that you can use. You have uh, synchronous commands like the read and write or info commands, um, but also asynchronous um, transfer like where you subscribe to a specific IO and then get the publication message from the robot in a continuous stream. We were a little bit lazy and just implemented what we needed for our use case, which is uh, the synchronous calls and the asynchronous readout. Uh, so there are some restrictions. The code itself you can actually find uh, in the repository of one of my students, which also did most of the implementation work. Um, so this is a fork of industrial core where you can find, of course, the, the client itself and also the added I.O. Uh, messages and simple message format definitions. And down here you also have some implementation details if you're curious, because we unfortunately did not stick in all cases to the wrap. Um, which was sometimes a communication issue, sometimes a little bit of laziness. So in order for this to actually be merged or be useful for the, for the mainline ROS industrial core, I think we'll have to do some cleanup work. But if you want to check it out beforehand, um, you can, of course, look into this. And just to give you a little idea about how it, how it actually works and how we implement it, it's, so this is um, the communication that you would see in the simple message format. So this is going down to the controller. And what's important here is the um, bold part. So you see that we actually have a quite a simple payload indicating a type, index, and the values. For example, write digital output on pin 5 um, to the value 1. And we get a return value indicating that everything worked or didn't work if there was any error. And uh, the ROS API was kept quite similar to that. So we're keeping a quite low level interface, giving the user the power to actually decide what they want to do. So we also put some additional wrapper nodes in there, for example, like the binary IO write wrapper node, which then offers you a trigger service call. So just for convenience and to show you how to use it. And there are some restrictions, uh, like, for example, the subscription range can only be chosen at the startup. But I think this is quite easily fixable if we want to. Um, OK, maybe just uh, our experience with this was very good. It worked really, really well for uh, the simple commands that we wanted to use, for example, like cylinders uh, and safety IOs and all the stuff. Um, and I think the overhead to implement it was actually not that big. So I can really recommend it if you have some simple application where you need it. So just quickly, some other projects. Um, I myself maintain two different um, repositories. Um, both are for Shunk hardware, the five finger hand, and also an LVA4P um, driver. It's a can open driver. We have some other projects like the Europe project where we develop a cat to path. Um, tools, force-based exploration, also the human brain project where we deal a lot with um, gazebo and other simulators. Um, and of course, we're using ROS uh, at all kinds of robotic research, uh, mainly for autonomous robots like our six-legged walking robot you see up uh, on the right. And um, also to really fastly integrate components. So big hit this year was our Bratwurst bot, which you see in the middle. And it only took us a couple of weeks, thanks to ROS, basically, because we had all the components in place, um, but also to integrate other stuff. So down here, you see a Raspberry Pi shaft in the in the base of a Shunk arm. Um, so all you need is 24 volts and are ready to go. So uh, that's it. I hope it didn't take too long. And we have time for some questions. Uh, if you want to contact me, these are the details. And I'm happy to answer any question. Good. Any questions? Control speed rate of what? I if you mean for the for the Fanuc IO, um, no. I think we are running the node at thirty hertz, um, but it's I don't think that it is restricted to that. Um, I, or to be honest, I'm I'm not sure. I didn't try to to maximize it. Um, the thirty hertz were more than enough. And if you run it on streaming mode, it will be quite um, not that resource hungry. Maybe uh, one thing I'll have to say is that we took the easy way out and used a second socket for the streaming. Um, 
So we are opening one socket to send the commands and receive the synchronous data. Um, I don't know if it's if I can go back to it. Yeah, so we, we have one socket here, um, one for the synchronous data and one for the asynchronous data, which is kind of the lazy way out um, but it helps and we didn't have a shortage of TCP ports. Um, so there wasn't any issue in going as high as we would like. Okay, please explain a little bit more about cat to path um, So I could do a whole talk about that, but I think I have a few minutes to spare. So um, in the Europe project, and also we use this for, for rehab as well. So we had to uh, come up with a way to create quite complex trajectories in contact um, with, an, with an object. And what we did for that is that we um, at the moment have to apply a little bit of um, manual um, Cardo application and simulation video demonstrated physically. Yes. Uh, okay. So we have to apply a little bit of manual smoothing beforehand, and then we can load it up um, as Collada file basically in a web application where we use um, the ROS web tools and 3JS and stuff like that uh, to visualize it. And then uh, just use basically JavaScript to draw on it. As you can see here, the green line um, is drawn by placing these red um, triangles here and the triangles are projected on the surface and with that we can create um, trajectories which are in contact and quite complex uh, fitted with splines to the surface. I can maybe give a talk about that next time because it's a little bit more um, complicated and um, at the moment it's not open source uh, yet because we're currently still developing it um, and I don't know if there are any plans to put it open source in the near future. Um, but if you're really willing to contact me, if you really, really need it. Um, and the door application scenario was shown in reality on the Automatica 2016. It was shown uh, quite a long time. And um, I have videos of it, but they are not yet up on YouTube, but we are planning to put them on YouTube in the near future. So look out for that. OK, good. Thank you, George. Okay, we can start now. So, hi, I'm uh, Suraj Nair, and uh, uh, I, I have my colleague Nikhil Somani here with me, and we will be talking about Tomb Robotics in Singapore. So, let's start. I've also pasted a video in the message box in case uh, we don't have time or uh, uh, if it's not clear enough by sharing the screen itself. So I'll talk quickly about Tomb Create Robotics, uh, what kind of projects we are doing in Singapore very, very quickly, and then uh, more about a, uh, one of our flagship projects in Singapore, which is uh, Aviation Challenge 2, where we are uh, actually uh, using ROS to a great extent. So a little bit about Tomb Create Robotics. So we come from our uh, HQ based in Germany, which is TUM, Technical University of Munich. Uh, and we come from the informatics school of robotics. So the department of robotics, which is housed in the informatics faculty by professor Alois Knoll. Uh, he heads, he's the director of robotics and embedded systems group at TUM. He also heads the transfer institute for this uh, game BI in Germany. And in Singapore, we exist in the form of the cognitive systems and robotics group. Uh, we are only two years old in Singapore and uh, although we are growing rapidly. Going to my next slide. So robotics portfolio, we've been in uh, robotics for the last 31 years and uh, mainly in Europe. And we are covering pretty much all areas of robotics, industrial, cognitive service, medical, and very strongly also into management of very big uh, robotics projects in Europe. For example, the Human Brain Project, where Professor Knoll heads the uh, neuro robotics uh, sub project, and also the ECHOD and ECHOD++. So, and in uh, Europe, we are partnering with almost all major robot manufacturers and tier one suppliers in the automotive industry. Uh, we are quite new in Singapore, uh, only two, two and a half years, but we are already involved in a lot of activities and most of them uh, involve ROS as well. Uh, like Kong Hui mentioned before in the first presentation, we are also one of the partners in the CERC industrial robotics program where we are mainly building up a cognitive architecture for uh, semantic knowledge representation and reasoning for high-level decision-making in uh, distributed robotic systems. Uh, we are also working uh, with the robot platform uh, in Munich, where we are developing high-level intelligence uh, for this um, robot uh, head, 
for human robot interaction. Uh, we are doing some work with Festo and REC in Munich uh, in the domain of service robotics. And uh, one of our flagship projects in Singapore is uh, the Aviation Challenge 2, which I will now go to and explain in more detail because it's heavily relying on ROS. So uh, I'm not sure if this uh, animation works here, but uh, sorry for the slide though. I will just uh, give you a quick introduction about what uh, Aviation Challenge is. So Singapore is one of the global uh, leaders in aviation or uh, uh, at least airport infrastructures in the world, where the Singapore airport is has been rated number one for the last 10, 15 years in a row. So and it's uh, heavy, heavily under expansion, both in the passenger domain and also in the cargo domain. So the Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore, which is a government entity which controls the airspace and all the airports in Singapore, uh, came up with a challenge uh, heavily relying on automation and robotics in order to automate a lot of processes, both in the uh, civilian airport and the cargo airport. And they came up with two call for proposals, uh, namely Aviation Challenge 1 for the uh, passenger terminal and Aviation Challenge 2 for the cargo terminal. And Toon Create was one of the uh, teams selected to run uh, the Aviation Challenge 2, which is basically automating the buildup and breakdown of uh, cargo pallets, which actually uh, are packed with uh, cargo um, and uh, loaded onto the aircrafts for air cargo. So this uh, Aviation Challenge 2, which deals with cargo handling, it's quite a complex problem. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically a palletization problem, but without knowing what you're actually palletizing. This makes the problem really a big one with high mix issues. So uh, it's highly manpower intensive working at heights and uh, uh, requires manual and heavy material handling. And the main part of the challenge comes uh, uh, from the payload itself, which can uh, in size vary from 30 centimeters to two meters in uh, dimensions. And in, in the form of weight, it can vary anywhere from one kilo to uh, five tons for a, one single shipment. And this makes the problem quite uh, diverse and large in terms of volume uh, and weight. And therefore, traditional palletization techniques uh, cannot be used. Uh, and also, one size fits all solution is not practical here. So this was basically the outcome. Uh, we came up with a design philosophy of uh, having a close co cognition loop in the form of perception, cognition, and action in order to solve this problem. So basically, understand what you're trying to grasp, and then uh, within the capabilities of your actuators, try to uh, achieve maximum automation uh, from whatever is possible. And for this architecture, we are using ROS as a middleware. So this is how our system looks like. Uh, we are relying on a very large gantry robot. It's around uh, eight meters in height in terms of the vertical stroke. Uh, it can lift up to 500 kilos of payload while providing a re uh, precision or repeatability of 0 0.1 millimeters. This can move very fast, uh, up to 4 meters per second, and also very slow with the same precision. We also have perception systems to detect the cargo and automatically plan and optimize the packing process. There is a video which I will play now uh, to show how the system looks like in the form of the gantry itself. So this uh, motion is all controlled by ROS. Of course, we have a low-level interface to the Google robot uh, through uh, the a ABB IRC5 controller, but all, all the high-level decision-making is done by ROS.
I will I will stop there and continue. So this was just about the robot, and uh, currently we are uh, okay. So that's what uh, we just commissioned this robot, and currently we are uh, moving ahead with the systems integration and the application de development. I will now hand over to my colleague uh, Nikhil, who will actually give a little bit. Uh, more detail about the low-level components and also the components which are actually relying on ROS. Hello. Uh, so the first systems or the first subsystem that uh, we have here is a, a perception system for detect detecting and tracking the cargo. And uh, this is uh, basically measuring all the boxes that uh, that come into the system. Uh, so they have to be placed in this uh, in this measurement area, and then we have multiple. RGBD cameras from which uh, we can estimate the uh, the dimensions of the object, the labels that are on that, and uh, we use uh, ROS extensively, especially for synchronizing all the cameras that we have, and also PCL to some extent. Uh, the accuracy that we can achieve with this is around one centimeters for a two meter long uh, box, and, uh, and this is uh, relying only on uh, consumer grade uh, cameras like the Kinect version two. Another subsystem uh, we have is uh, the, the actual cognitive capability, which is uh, optimizing the placement of these uh, cargo uh, packets onto the pallet. So as you can see in the picture here, uh, we have some heuristics on how to uh, optimize the placement of these boxes, uh, keeping in mind different constraints like uh, fragile objects cannot uh, should, be, uh, should be handled with care and uh, not stacked on top. And... Uh, uh, also the weight distribution and optimizing the center of mass and so on. So this is a mathematical optimization problem. And uh, this whole thing, of course, is online. So this is not, uh, uh, this is not done offline because we, we can do this as, uh, as and when the cargo comes. Uh, for the visualization for this, uh, we are using Arvis extensively, not only for our debugging, but also for some interaction. Uh, Another component uh, that we use from ROS is uh, the Smash Execution Engine. Uh, this is for modeling high-level behaviors of the robot and uh, and define and modeling the interconnection between all these subsystems in in a more uh, generic and more standardized way. And we're using the tool called FlexP, uh, which is uh, which is a nice graphical user interface and also an execution engine over the over the Smash. Uh, package from ROS. And so far, we've found it uh, quite useful, not only for modeling, uh, modeling the states and, uh, and uh, running them, but also for controlling the runtime and uh, execution monitoring, as you see in the picture here. So yeah, these are, uh, these are the, uh, these are the modules where we use ROS extensively. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all from our side. Uh, another extension, since I have a few more minutes, another extension that I'm planning, uh, that we are planning for this, uh, the FlexV engine is a plugin for formal verification, where you can load the state machines and have this uh, formally checked by a tool like uh, Spin. Uh, this is basically done using uh, an exporter to the Promilla modeling language. And this is, uh, this is one feature that we are also looking uh, to release as open source hopefully in the future, and we are working closely with the developers of FlexB for this uh, for this particular module. And uh, I think this can also be relevant for the Ross Industrial, for people industri interested in Ross Industrial applications. Yeah. Thanks, Nikhil. So that's all about our talk for today, and this is our team in Singapore. Uh, and uh, any questions, you can just write to us or visit the website. Thank you. Okay, thank you, you sir. Yeah. Nice presentation. Nice presentation. Any questions? The palletization software is not currently available in the form of open source code, but we are just waiting for a publication to get through. Mm -hmm. And then we would be uh, uh, thinking about releasing it open source. Yes. So right now this transfer is done uh, manually, but yeah. So uh, uh, this is a very good question about how the boxes are transferred. So uh, the current design of the uh, system footprint is quite 
unoptimal because we have to stick to the constraints of the challenge. So the aviation challenge has a constraint with the robot footprint because uh, there is a protocol on how the teams will be judged uh, on their performance. But if we want to scale it up to a real pro uh, business case or uh, make an industrial product, of course, we will just make the gantry uh, longer so that everything can be handled automatically. So we have we are already looking into this. So in that case, you would not need a transfer. Yeah. So the robot can directly pick it from the scanning area. Uh, this is why we also have a larger vision. Uh, I just go one slide behind where you can see that an, uh, the gantry is very long and it can. Uh, there are multiple uh, robots on it. Uh, and they can work in uh, independently or also collaboratively on different stations or at, or on the same station at the same time. So in this case, they have a much uh, longer reach. One last question. Uh, the gripper the gripper is a very good question again. Uh, of course, there is no gripper uh, which we can buy out of the box. Uh, and uh, this is something which is quite um, uh, intrinsic to the challenge. So we are making our own hardware and uh, the gripper design is one of it, one or one uh, part of it. Uh, so we, we have a couple of tools which we are designing, uh, but they are not 100% um, integrated yet. But uh, with this system, we are trying to lift up to 300 kilos of payload with multiple grippers. And of course we have a tool changer. We have a tool change me mechanism, and uh, other than the robot controller, we have another uh, real-time back-off uh, network with uh, multiple uh, tools, uh, actuators, and sensors, which are independent of the robot itself. One last question. Well, it's uh, the verification that we are trying to do is only a behavior-level verification. It's it's not uh, verifying the hardware, so it's not verifying hardware in loop per se. It's verifying that the behavior is valid and. Uh, if there are unreachable states in the behavior or if there's a deadlock situation or something like that. Uh, it's, it's not really a hardware verification. Yes, yes, fragility of the packages is considered. This is a part of the constraints in the bin packing. Uh, we also have auxiliary sensing systems to know if a package is good enough to be grasped or not. So for example, we also do analysis on the surface to see how to best grasp, grasp a package. Um, hi, everybody. So uh, my presentation is going to be done all in a video. So I'm posting the link right now. So if everybody uh, could open this video on your browser to follow the presentation, I think it's going to be better than the screen share that we're going to do. Cool. So let's get started. Um, today, I'll be talking about Gazebo's uh, latest UX features. Some of them are uh, have been there in Gazebo for a while, but some people don't know it. Uh, some of them are new, like are going to be released in Gazebo 8, which are, we are releasing this month. Um, and I'm doing the whole presentation within Gazebo. So um, for you, uh, for people who don't know what Gazebo is, here's a general view of what Gazebo can do. Uh, Gazebo is a multi-purpose uh, robot simulator. So it can simulate not only uh, industrial arms, which is the main focus of this uh, talk today, but it can simulate humanoids, uh, flying underwater robots, it can simulate like whale robots. So there's a lot that you can do. Today, I'm prepared this little uh, simulation slash presentation for you guys inside Gazebo using a industrial arm. Um, so let's jump straight into it. So uh, let's start with model introspection. This is uh, one of the new things that we have in Gazebo. If you right click your model and you choose view, you can see several aspects of your model right there within the simulation. Uh, right now I'm showing you the joints. So you can see uh, all the joints in your model. This is, this is a UR10 and it has a lot of Revolut joints. You can see how they're placed. Um, so another thing that you can see, I'm gonna hide the joints here and I'm gonna show you the link frames. Um, so this is the origin for each one of the links in your model. Uh, so you can quickly see if the links are positioned wrong or, or if there is a mistake because fine-tuning your model in simulation can be uh, a little bit uh, time-consuming. So having these tools to verify your model uh, are very helpful. Now I'm showing you the center of mass of each link in the robot. Uh, you can see these spheres represent the mass of each link. Uh, the size of the sphere is proportional to the mass. So you can have an idea if your link is too heavy or too light. 
Um, there is also the, uh, related to that the visualization of inertia. So this is based on the inertia matrix for each link that you that you put in your SDF or URDF description of your robot. Um, so you can see if this box is kind of weirdly shaped, it means that you didn't uh, put your inertia very well. And finally, I'm here showing you the collisions. Um, so you can see that the collisions are made of cylinders, simple shapes. Instead of using the whole mesh of the robot, this helps uh, with the, the simulation itself, makes it faster and, and makes planning easier. Another uh, really cool thing that you can do is contact visualization. So if you go on the top and choose view contacts, you can see that these uh, blue spheres with green lines showed up. These are all the contacts being calculated by the physics engine. Uh, you can see them in real time. You can see how the objects are touching the uh, conveyor belt. Here I'm teleoperating the arm to touch uh, the conveyor belt, so you can see where the arm touches it. Uh, it again, another helpful tool for you to debug your simulation as it's running. Um, oh, the conveyor belt started moving there. I think I forgot to turn it on before. Um, so yeah, so let's hide the contacts here. And uh, now uh, visual markers are something that is coming up new now in Gazebo 8, which is gonna be released in the end of this month. Uh, so it, there's a lot of things you can do with visual markers. They're basically uh, things that you can put in your 3D scene that are not seen by sensors. So cameras wouldn't see it, but the user looking can see it so you can debug. So right now you can see that I'm showing uh, the path that the that the gripper is doing on the 3D space. Uh, so I'm just plotting that in 3D. Uh, so it's one of the, the cool things that you can do with visual markers. This is just publishing uh, on a topic and you can make like shapes and lines and dots and everything you want. Another cool thing is the model editor. So uh, right now on simulation, you can right click any model and edit it in place uh, while your simulation is there. So you pause the simulation, uh, then the screen gets kind of white. In this, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you can keep going. Okay, and uh, so this is inside the model editor. Uh, you can see you uh, how the links are connected by joints. You can select them and uh, yeah, see all the parameters of your joints of your links as described in SDF, and you can edit them in place. And then I'm gonna open here the left panel. You can see uh, there is a model tab on the top. And it has the list of all the links and joints in the model. Again, you have access to all their properties. Um, let me open another link here to give you an idea. Uh, so this is a forearm and you can control like the visibility of all the collisions or of the visuals. So there's very fine grained control uh, when you're trying to put your model together. You can edit an existing model or even uh, start a whole model from scratch in the model editor. What I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna attach a little camera to the robot. So this little box is a camera. It's not the most beautiful camera, but uh, it's the model that we have here. The important thing is that it's a sensor that is gonna get data from the simulation. Um, so I'm attaching it with a fixed joint. I just created a joint by clicking on the, the 3D scene, which is very convenient. Um, so let's close here the, so the camera has been attached. We just need to save the, model and the moment you save and exit the model editor we're back in simulation and now our model has that camera that we just attached to it when we press play the arm kind of fell a little bit there i'm gonna tell well first let's open the camera uh topic viewer so um whoa. where is it yeah here it is so uh you know you can see the the feed of the camera that is attached to the robot right there on that little screen uh, window. And as I move the robot and teleoperating it with the keyboard, um, you can see that the cam Im camera image shows up there. You can pipe this data coming from this topic to you know anywhere you want to do your, your uh, image processing and, and things. So this is only one of the several sensors that you have in, in Gazebo. Uh, another cool thing that you can do is apply force or torque in things in simulation. So we have these objects here on the uh, on the conveyor belt. So I, you can just right click an object and then you see this dialogue where you can choose um, how much force you want to apply. And you just press and you can see that the little parts is there hopping 
with the the force that I'm uh, applying to it. Um, you can. I'm also gonna like press Control Z here. See, and the part came back up. So you, if uh, you go back in time when you undo things that you did in simulation, which can be very helpful. Finally, I'll show you here plotting, which is also new in Gazebo 8 that is coming up this month. Um, so uh, you can plot most aspects of your simulation right there. So there is this convenient search bar. I looked for the wrist and the Z position of the wrist. So as a teleoperated, it goes up and down and I can see uh, that pose in, uh, in plot. And you can export this plot as you want. You can see it's really bouncy because I didn't put much effort into tuning this PID here. But yeah, um, it's a good example of a plot. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's so much more that I could show you, but I only had 10 minutes. So, uh, you know, there's logging and playback. Playback is much better now in Gazebo. You can skip back to a specific moment and use all these visualization tools to see your simulation right there. There's a building editor besides the model editor. There are actors like that guy that is moving there, but and also you can script uh, models to just move around. Like if you want a target for your robot to look at or something like this, you can just have this scripted motion, undo, redo, hardware integration. Um, yeah, there is a lot there. There are things that are uh, like roads that are not so important for industrial arm, but for other applications, uh, it's very useful. Um, and if you want to use Gazebo with ROS, uh, each version of ROS kind of comes with, goes along with one version of Gazebo by default, but you can make your own combination. I have a link there uh, to the to the wrapper versions that you can use. And for on Gazebo 7, all the releases are synced with ROS. So we're releasing Gazebo 8 now in January and in May, I believe, uh, ROS Alterto is coming up, which is going to be Gazebo 8. So yeah, that's it. These are the resources, some links. Um, and thanks for listening. Any questions? Uh, is there a way to make a robot pure kinematic machine? Uh, uh, I believe at some point this was supported in Gazebo, but we didn't uh, maintain it properly. So I don't think it's working right now. But this is something that we have been talking about uh, making it making it uh, work again. So, you know, turning off dynamics would speed up computation a lot and it's enough for a lot of people. Um, yeah, plus one, plus one. Okay, noted. Uh, I'll let the team know. <laughs> The man is scary, yeah. <laughs> so this this uh, actor is actually it's a collada animation, and uh, it it this one is installed with Gazebo. When you install Gazebo, there is like the stalking one, there is a walking one, there is a moonwalking one, um, and if you have your own collada animation uh, models, you can you can import them into Gazebo. We only support certain kinds of animation, so not all of them might work, but the skeletal animation works for sure, which is the one for humans. Um, and and this specific man was done with uh, with motion capture, his movement. So you can see that it's kind of noisy in some places and he kind of shakes a little bit. It's actually noise on the motion capture. Um, off topic, how is the guy controlled or moving? Yeah, so it's just, uh, this one is just a open loop animation playing. Um, it's not it's not doing anything fancy, the, the guy. And actually something interesting about the, the guy as well, it's only visible to uh, rendering sensors. So if you have a, a CPU based uh, sensor like, uh, that gets a point cloud, it wouldn't get the, the actor. It would it's only visible to the GPU sensors right now. So it has no collision shapes basically. Uh, was the industrial apps just for us or was it for another project? Uh well I put together the simulation just for this presentation, but the the models in it uh I stole from another project that we we have right now. There is a competition going on called the ARIAC. You can uh, you can Google for it uh, A R I A C, uh, which we are doing together with NIST, I believe. So I just stole some models from there, <laughs> but yeah, I didn't 3D model this whole thing just for this. I I don't even have the skills to do that. Um, there's some green lights from the box. At 3:30, there's some green light from the box. What's that? Mm. Intel. Oh, the hardware spec for the simulation. So I'll start with the hardware 
back. Yeah, I did it on an Intel i7, but I, I believe I can run it even in a, in a computer with less RAM. RAM. Um, yeah, maybe AG RAM could, could be able to, to run the simulation. You can see that the real-time factor was one the whole time that I was recording the video. Um, maybe it's going to be a little bit slower than other computers, but I don't think it would be unus unusable. Let me see the 3 minutes 30. Uh, so I'm just changing it here. My Oh, the, the green stuff that is... Blinking, so this is the contact visualization. Uh, the green lines that are blinking on and off, this is showing where the forces are being applied by the physics engine when objects collide with each other. So it can be really helpful for you to just like pause simulation and step through and see where contacts are happening to understand what's going on. Uh, yeah, that's that's the green, green light. The green little lines, right? I, I believe that's what the, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Any other? Any other questions? Cool, yeah, I guess no more questions. Okay, if no more questions, I will hand over to, to Paul. Hey, everyone. This is uh, Paul Vaz from Southwest Research, just um, kind of wrapping it up here at the end. I uh, wanted to acknowledge that this was a collaboration between all three of our Ross Industrial Consortia, um, Europe, Asia, Pacific, and uh, the one in North America here. So um, our appreciation for all the presenters and, of course, to our host, uh, Chong Hui. So thank you all for attending. I will be posting this video uh, online uh, in the next few days, and so we'll be glad if you could share it with your friends and uh, I very much appreciate everyone's time and interaction.